I love mantra. Why do I love mantra? Because my teacher gave it to me. <laughs> and I love my teacher. So, um, and my relationship with my teacher is my relationship to myself. My teacher's form is my form, you know. Is reality itself arising? And I began to feel my own reality uh, residing in that which is great, this radiant cosmos unfolding in all its power and glory and beauty and intelligence and vast interrelatedness. I began to feel that, um, you know, having been brought up in the university system and the suburbs of New Zealand and the colonial white lifestyle of New Zealand, dissociated from all <laughs> yogas um, with only you know, corrupt patriarchal power structures as my religious source of information, you know, that created civilization. So, you know, I got to see my teachers in India. I was like, wow, you know, that being with my teachers informed me of my own reality. So I love my teachers for that reason. You know, my teachers and my, this body, this cosmos arising and, and that which is great. The absolute condition of reality itself. So when my teacher gives me a mantra, my mantra is from my teacher, and my mantra is the expression of that which is great, that has been given to me. That which is great has been given to me, and my mantra has been given to me, right? <laughs> so it's um, one of those yogas of participation. For me to connect me, to connect my mind to my own reality. You know, and my teacher, I'm speaking of Dasagacharya, the son of Krishnamacharya. Krishnamacharya, the teacher of all the teachers, Mr. Iyengar and Mr. Patabi Joyce, you know, the founder of Ashtanga Vinyasa, the teacher of Indra Devi, and you know, he's our the modern grandfather of yoga. So um, his son, Dasgacha, would say, Mark, there might be something in it. These mantras have been used for thousands of years by so many sages and rishis and, you know, realizers of God, of truth. So there might be something in it. You know, if you just use these mantras, these magical things could be there. And the in the mantras themselves, I go, wow, okay. He said, there may be something in it. I'm prepared to accept that idea. <laughs> but he said, more than that, there's something in it if you have faith in it. You know, if you just have faith, that if I do the Gayatri mantra, Om Pu Puvasvaha, Om Tat Savichovare En Yam, like that, if I truly have faith that that is my relationship to the goddess shakti to the nurturing power of this cosmos then that faith is how it works <laughs> not the magical power of the words itself but there may be some magical power who knows <laughs> it's worth trying but not as temple religion, not as, you know, that religion that's come through these corrupt power structures. Which is another whole thing in itself. You know, they took the Veda where there was no power structure. The guru was not an authority, not an identity, not a social special person, not, a, not even a personal identity. The guru is just the flow of nurturing and local community. That was the Veda, you know. The guru, God, deity, you know, your spouse, your body, are simply arising in one re one reality. Right? That was the yoga for thousands of years, which cult the, the yoga was the uh, the mother's milk of that culture, you know, and. Um, 
what happened in, is that orthodoxy, you know, or people would use the poetry of the Veda as um, a power mechanism and claim it as their own and say, only by me, you come to me and you will have access to God. You know, that corruption happened to religious life. And I will give you a special mantra. <laughs> and that created this insidious system of the, perf the perfected person implies that everybody else is not perfected. And you get to perfection through your through this agency of the special person. So I'm not talking about that. That, w that must be thrown out of our system for yoga to, be get, to begin, for mantra to be useful. Right? So this is the problem of our world today, you know, that, that we've created civilization on this basis of the special person that implies that everybody's not special and that you have to come to this imagined place of God realization, the hoax of enlightenment, you know, the seduction of enlightenment. You have to get to it through whatever arbitrary, and these, see these power structures, they don't hold the yogas of participation. They were interested in denying individuation, denying the power of the individual, denying sex, denying pleasure, even denying wealth of the individual for the power structure's grandeur, survival. And this is the thought structure of every human person walking around. They're in that system. I'm not perfect. There is an idea. There is this future perfection. I mean, a lot of people become atheists, throwing that out of their system. But what's, what's left is the, the shell of this hierarchical system and all its um, shallowness and its boredom and its exaggeration and pornography and dumbed down media and alcohol and pharmaceuticals to try to dull the, you know, keep, keep everybody bumbling along, you know. So you either have that or you have the temple religion, you know, the, the good luck God, this, if you appeal to some higher force, you know, some perfected future person that you might be. Um, so there's no yoga in that. There's no mantra in that. It's a waste of time. If you use mantra like that, you're wasting your time, you know. So mantra is very useful in a yogic life where the yogas of participation are given to each person free of this hoax of enlightenment there is no enlightenment there's no such thing there is life happening as you and me and every person walking down the street that's what's happening you know like this extraordinary universe that we are in is everybody's obvious condition you know there's no need for this idea of some perfected person that's going to give it to you. you know, my teacher used to say, nobody need give this to you and no one can take it away from you. You are it. You are the power of this cosmos. Arising is pure intelligence and utter beauty. You are in a perfected harmony with the rest of the cosmos, with air. This body knows exactly what it's doing with air. This body knows exactly what it's doing with light, with the green realm, you know, with the plant kingdom, with water, and with the male and female collaboration, which is the nurturing force of life. It is our literal mother and father, you know. <laughs> it is the, the great caring that is life itself, the great compassion that is the nature of our own existence is the male female it is an intrinsic natural harmony that we are in everything is sex everything is a flower is sex you know a tree is you know everything is this exchange of opposites and perfect equal and opposites in perfect harmony uh, where one empowers the other you know this is our condition 
You don't have to get to it. You don't have to get it. You don't have to feel a lack of it and try to get it. Just it's like you don't have to feel a lack of God and try to get God through these corrupt patriarchal systems that stole the poetry of the Veda and created their miserable power structures that made the humanity miserable and took sex off every individual or exaggerated it to vulgarity, you know, in its outburst of illness that happened. So this is what yoga is about, each person's direct embrace of life itself, that which is great, and mantra is a part of that. So in the yogas, the yogas of participation, you know, asana, pranayama, uh, and meditation, uh, mantra can be used in the context of these yogas as a yoga in itself, this vibratory force. And I said it comes powered from the base of the body, the exhale is coming through the vocal cords and they are changed with the you know, oral beauty of how we make language, you know. And um, the asana can be used, at, sorry, mantra can be used any time in asana to replace the exhale. And people, my students explore that as is given to me and they explore it and it's quite special. Uh, and mantra can be vocal, it can be quite loud, you know, strong uh, and soft and all the degrees between strong, soft and silent right? and, and then silent. Yeah. So you can use silent mantra too. Um, and I want to make the point that the yogas were given in an oral tradition. You know, I think the written word was around about 500, 400 BC before it became a thing. You know, and so um, it's re it's really important, really beautiful that all this spiritual transmission came through thousands of years of oral tradition, and there was this culture of, especially a seven-year time. In early, you know, the, the years of 14 to 21, then 21 to 28 were these very important sort of brahmacharya years where you, you just um, took on the oral tradition of your culture. There was no discussion of the meaning of the mantra at all uh, because um, it was said that if you, if you duplicated the mantra in the way that your teacher gave it, then you were duplicating the teacher's state. There's something incredible about that. So when I learnt mantra from my teachers, Daskachar and Krishnamacharya, there was no discussion around meeting. It was a little frustrating for a Western mind. A, but what does it mean? <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Just say the mantra. And another beautiful thing in that understanding is that in Sanskrit, this ancient language in which uh, spiritual wisdom was orally transmitted and then later written in the Devanagari in text. Um, it was known to be onomatopoeic, where the, the meaning and the form and the sound were, are one. You know, so the bottom line is like splash means splash. We all know what, a, you know, we've got this image, splash, <laughs> you know, jumping in the swimming pool, splash. It's a beautiful word, splash. Well, the whole of the Veda is like that. The Sanskrit's like that, onomatopoeic. And I love to say, om means om. Beyond that, no further discussion is needed. <laughs> the Western mind will go, om. Hey. Uh, the all-pervading absolute condition of the universe. <laughs> om, fair enough. But om is om, and it needs no further meaning attached to it, no further language attached to it. So, you know, even now, you know, modern Western students, they, they, do, they do all the other yogas, and it's simply just sitting there and going, om, in the accurate way in which the, it was linguistically formed in the ancient world. They have an experience of the absolute arising as the whole body, you see. 
So that's a beautiful thing to understand. Just say the mantra, you know, Om Shreem Shri Hai Namaha. It's not a sign for Lakshmi that's going to come in the future. Om Shreem Shri Hai Namaha is Lakshmi. Right? The vibration is her, just like the yantra is her. You know, Shri, Shri Yantra, the downward trend there. If you give this to a, a yogi in India, they'll go, oh, you know, see the yantra. The yantra is the divine, you see. The mantra is the divine. So just say the mantra and it's all there. That's the, the point of view of that great tradition. It's not a cleaving for, it's not a hopefulness, wanting to get something, you know. Yoga is not attempting to get something as a future possibility through heroic effort, you know, or mastery of something difficult. Yoga is each person's direct embrace of reality itself that is their own arising. You know, God is given. You don't get to God. You don't have to get to God. Here is God. So just do the yogas of direct participation in life as it is. So just say Om. <laughs> and everything is Om, you know, or the, the, the mantra that your teacher gives you. That's how mantra works.